Um, so yeah, you know, with that being said, would love to introduce Kenton, who is one of our field engineers based in Burning Hot, Seattle right now. And uh, she's gonna take you through the... Uh, thanks, Raj. Yeah, so hi, everybody. Uh, again, thanks for joining. We're so happy to have you here with us. Uh, I'm Kenton, I'm a field engineer and astronomer. Um, as Raj said today, be going through an introduction to airflow you know, with a focus on using airflow for ETL, which is a really common use case. Uh, we'll get even a little more granular there and go into ETL with Snowflake since it's such a popular tool. Um, see that, just throw any questions as we go through in the chat. Um, and with that, I will dive right in. So I can imagine there are some people who are familiar with airflow at least a little bit here, um, maybe more interested in the Snowflake side, but uh, as we said, we are going to start um, just with an introduction. So I'll run through some slides, kind of going through the you know, core um, components and concepts within Airflow uh, for anybody who's less familiar or if you just need a refresher, um, if you haven't been working with Airflow a lot lately. Um, from there, we'll kind of dive into a demo of actually using Airflow for ETL with Snowflake. Uh, we'll leave plenty of time at the end for just general Q&A um, on you know, Airflow introduction or um, topics like that, again, if, the, um, if there isn't a time during the presentation for those questions. Uh, so with that, I'll dive right in and uh, just give a bit of an overview, again, just in case uh, anybody here is uh, on the very new side with Airflow and is less familiar with it as a tool. Um, Airflow was originally developed uh, inside of Airbnb. It's obviously since been open source, so it's now a top-level Apache Software Foundation project. Uh, currently has over a million downloads every month, so it's really popular. Um, it has a really robust and active community, which is part of what makes it such a great open source tool. So um, obviously at Astronomer, we're heavily invested in open source Airflow, and we really believe it's kind of the standard for uh, code-based data orchestration. Um, so what is Airflow? Just really simply, it's a tool for programmatically authoring, scheduling, and monitoring your data pipelines. Um, so one of the core uh, tenets of Airflow that we'll see here is pipelines as code. Um, so everything is obviously written in Python code. Um, that makes your uh, pipeline super dynamic. Anything you can do in Python, you can do in Airflow. Uh, so that's really powerful. Uh, it's also super extensible, so we'll talk a lot about that. It's very relevant for the Snowflake use case, but how Airflow plays well with lots of other services, other tools, um, that's what it's designed to do as an orchestrator. Uh, and finally, Airflow is super scalable. So at Astronomer, we have customers that are running thousands of tasks every day using Airflow, and it handles all of that easily. Uh, so I'll start um, kind of on the Airflow basics with some of the core components. And I'll note that these are more on the Airflow infrastructure side. So uh, if you're you know, writing your data pipelines in Airflow, uh, we won't, uh, you don't need to know too much about these in terms of how they actually work. And I won't go through them in too much depth, but uh, they are useful to understand because anytime you're running Airflow, even if it's just locally, like I'll show today, uh, these are the components that are going to get spun up that you need to run Airflow. So you'll see these terms, uh, it's useful to kind of know what they are. Um, so the three main components that you need to run Airflow are the web server, uh, which is your Flask server that's going to serve your UI. Uh, your scheduler, which is the daemon responsible for scheduling your jobs, really important for an orchestrator and scheduling tool. Uh, and finally, your meta store. So this is your backend database where all of your metadata are stored. So this is typically Postgres, but there are a couple of different options with Airflow. And then I'll go through a couple of others um, that aren't necessarily part of the core components, but they are important uh, for running Airflow and they do sort of live more on the infrastructure side. Uh, the first being your executor. So this is going to define how your tasks get executed. And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about uh, the different ones that are available. Um, finally, you have workers. So these are your processes executing your tasks that are defined by the executor. Um, what your workers look like will depend on which executor you choose and um, your Airflow infrastructure. Uh, so you may or may not have separate workers. Um, but again, uh, another moving piece that you might have to keep track of. 
Uh, so in terms of the executors that you have available to you, um, there's a couple of main ones we'll cover here, mainly local, celery, and Kubernetes. Um, they're good in different situations. Uh, we see people using all three and even combinations of them uh, for different airflow deployments. Um, local, which I'll be using today, to obviously run on my local machine, uh, is good for local and development environments. In that case, all of your tasks run along with your scheduler. Um, so in the same pod as your scheduler, if you're running in a Dockerized setup, which is how we do things at Astronomer. Um, uh, so that's, again, great for um, local work or development environments where you want sort of lower overhead in terms of cost and infrastructure. Definitely not as scalable, obviously. Um, if you are looking in production and looking to scale out, you would want to look to either Celery or Kubernetes. Um, again, both are really great in different situations. Um, Celery tends to be better for if you have a high volume of shorter running tasks. Uh, with Celery, you have workers that are sitting there ready to go um, when your tasks spin up. Uh, the Kubernetes executor is going to spin up a Kubernetes pod for each different task. So they're really great for auto scaling and task level configuration. Um, there's also no downtime with Kubernetes Executor uh, if you're making deployments um, or changes to your airflow environment. So if you have long running tasks that require, um, you know, a lot of CPU or memory, maybe you're training a machine learning model, something like that, that can be a good choice. Um, so next we're going to dive into the core concepts of airflow. So these are going to be more related to actually writing your DAGs um, or your data pipelines uh, within Airflow. Um, the three that I'll go through uh, are again, your DAG. So that's the highest level concept within Airflow, it stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. Um, tasks, which are uh, the nodes within that DAG um, that actually uh, define a unit of work. Uh, and finally, your operators, which are kind of a task template. So I'll go through each of these in detail. Um, Again, first is your DAG, which represents your data pipeline. Um, it's the highest level of the unit within Airflow. Um, it is a collection of either one or many tasks. So you can think of each task as like a node in that graph. Um, and your DAG is just gonna define how those tasks will be run. Um, so the order, you can define any dependencies, any rules for running them. Um, we'll also define when tasks get run. So uh, start date, schedule interval, uh, the only rules for a DAG are that um, your tasks flow in one direction and have no loops, so hence directed and acyclic. So this example on the top here is valid uh, with a couple of simple dependencies between your tasks. Um, something like this on the bottom would be invalid because you have um, uh, T1 is dependent on a task that comes after it, T4. So that could create an infinite loop in your code, which is obviously bad. You don't want that, um, so you can't do something like that. Um, but otherwise, you're free to define your DAG in whatever way makes sense for your use case. Uh, so the next drilling down kind of one level deeper, uh, the next concept is a task. Um, so again, this is a unit of work within your DAG. Um, it's Airflow's basic unit of execution. Um, you can have uh, dependencies between your tasks. So um, defining things uh, upstream of another task or downstream of another task, such as in this example. Um, when you actually run your DAG, uh, you will get a task instance for each task. So that's a specific run of that task. So a DAG for a DAG, for a task, um, for a point in time, that's your task instance. That's another um, term that you'll probably see come up. And then the last kind of core concept is an operator. So this is going to determine what gets done by each of those tasks. So you can think of it as kind of like a wrapper around each task as like shown in this diagram. Um, that's going to, again, define how your task is run uh, or what it does and uh, abstract away a lot of the code that you would otherwise have to write yourself. Um, so there are a couple of main types of operators. Um, sort of operators uh, which um, are going to run once with a defined unit of, of action. So that might be something like uh, run a Python function using the Python operator or run a bash script using the bash operator. Um, or they might do more complicated things like stuff we'll talk about today, like uh, transfer data from S3 to Snowflake using the S3 to Snowflake transfer operator. Um, the other type uh, that I'll 
mention here is sensors. Um, so rather than just doing a unit of work, um, sensors will wait for some external condition to be satisfied. Um, so that might be looking for uh, a particular status of a, another task within Airflow. Um, that could be looking for a file to land in S3, um, something like that. Uh, sensors are a great way to make your DAGs more kind of event driven. Um, Airflow is a batch scheduling tool, um, but it can be made more dynamic if you don't have, um, you know, pipelines that run on a particular schedule. Um, sensors can be a great way to implement that. Um, and then the next thing I'll cover kind of related to operators uh, are Airflow providers. So providers are separate packages. Um, they're uh, distinct from the core Airflow distribution um, as of Airflow 2.0. Um, they're often maintained by the community and the um, you know, maintainers of the actual tools that they're supporting. So these packages will likely contain hooks and operators or sensors to interact with some external system. So we'll talk in depth today about the Snowflake provider, um, which is obviously a provider package used to um, have Airflow interact with Snowflake. Um, there are many others uh, for you know most of the common um, data related services out there. Um, our registry, which is linked here, and I'll also show it a little bit later, um, is a great place to discover all of the providers out there and how to use them. Um, but again, I'll come back to this is one of the great things about Airflow being having such a robust open source community and a benefit to Airflow 2.0, having these provider packages separate from the core distribution means that the community can um, develop and maintain uh, and update all of these great packages that again, just make your life a lot easier. So um, you don't have to figure out how to write the code to do these things, somebody else has already done it. Um, and because they're separate from the core distribution and Airflow 2.0, um, they can be maintained much more regularly and you can update them kind of at any point uh, without having to update your core Airflow uh, instance, which um, is really useful. So kind of combining all of those concepts, um, this is just to show, kind of highlight the flexibility of having your data pipelines in code uh, with Airflow and using those provider packages to interact with external services. Um, you can have a pipeline that's really complicated, as you can see here, and interacts with all sorts of different services. And you can implement this without really a lot of code. Um, and when a new business requirement comes up, it's pretty easy to add that in. Um, you can just you know, add in a new operator to your DAG, set your dependencies, and you're off and running. So uh, with that, I'll hop into uh, the demo so we can actually see some of this in practice. For that, um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about actually running Airflow um, in this uh, demo, but I will add that if anybody has questions about how to do that, we're happy to address them during the Q&A or we're always happy to talk more um, about how to run Airflow. That's kind of our bread and butter at Astronomy, obviously. Um, but for this example, um, I'm just going to uh, run Airflow locally using the Astronomer CLI. Uh, our CLI is uh, free, it's open source, it's available for anybody to use. Uh, it's the easiest way to get Airflow up and running locally. Uh, we do so using Docker, that's the only prerequisite for you to use it. Um, to do that, I can just do astro dev init to initialize a project. Uh, I've already done that in this directory. So uh, what that's gonna do is it's gonna create me a Docker file used to run, again, Airflow in a Dockerized setup as well as supporting uh, folder structure and files um, for me to add my DAGs and any dependencies. So we'll look in depth at kind of what one of those projects looks like in just a minute. Um, but from there, I can do astro dev start, uh, which is going to spin me up a couple of containers. I've actually already done that in this case. Uh, might appear to be talking, Seattle is really, really hot right now and um, Docker is uh, requires a lot of CPU. So I wanted to make sure everything was good and running before this started. Um, but if I do a Docker PS, uh, you can see that I have three containers up and running here. Um, again, these are gonna correspond to those core components that I talked about earlier, uh, your scheduler, web server, and uh, this is me the opposite web, this one's the web server, scheduler, and Postgres database for the Metastore. So I have all of those up and running. 
uh, if I pop back over to uh, my browser here, navigate to my local host, e, um, you can see here I have Airflow up and running. Uh, this is, uh, I am running Airflow 2.0, um, so I'm gonna walk through the UI a little bit for anybody who's less familiar with Airflow, just so you can get a sense of what's going on here, but just note that uh, if you are using an older version of Airflow, you might not have all of this Airflow functionality um, because 2.0 had uh, quite a few UI updates that are really nice. Um, uh, so on the homepage here, uh, this is gonna show me kind of a list of all my DAGs. Um, so again, each one of these is a data pipeline. They correspond to a Python file. Um, I'll look through in just a second. I'm going to start on this example DAG before I dive into the Snowflake specific um, use case. I will get there in just a minute, I promise. Um, but before I do, I again just want to highlight some of the uh, functionality here within the UI. So uh, for each of my DAGs, I have a couple of views that are going to be useful to me. Um, the one I'll start with is the graph view. Um, so this is exactly like what it sounds like. It's going to show me a graphical overview of my DAG. This is really useful for um, learning kind of what's going on in any given DAG, um, what tasks you have and how the dependencies are. Uh, when I'm developing DAGs, I use this view to ensure that I'm setting the dependencies correctly in the code. Um, obviously, in this case, they're pretty simple, but you can imagine they could get really complex for a real world use case. And this is a great way, especially working locally, to uh, figure out if things are, um, you know, laid out the way you think they should be. Um, other view that's uh, interesting here is the tree view. Um, so again, this is also going to show me kind of a layout of my DAG and all of the tasks, but importantly, it will also show um, an overview of all of my recent DAG runs. Uh, each of these boxes represents a task instance, and they are obviously color coded to uh, show the status. So. In this particular case, uh, they were all successful, but if there were any failures or skipped tasks, um, et cetera, I would see those show up here. Also point out the code view here um, and kind of walk through this a little bit for the example DAG. Um, so within Airflow, uh, you can't actually edit the code from the UI here. Um, but it is a really useful way to um, look at the code. So either if you don't have access to kind of the underlying um, DAG code uh, and you want to know sort of what's going on within the DAG, this can be a great place to look. Um, it's also helpful when you're developing to look to make sure that your updates are being brought in. So you can check and make sure that um, the code that Airflow thinks it has for that DAG is what you expected. Um, for this particular DAG, again, this is just kind of a simple example. Um, but I have all of my imports here at the top. So again, I'm importing all of my various operators. Um, I have a Python function that I'm defining that's going to get called by my Python operator. I then have some default arguments that are applied to all of my different tasks. So uh, Airflow has a lot of different configurations. Uh, it's super flexible in how you set up uh, how your tasks and your DAGs get run. I won't go through all of them in detail today, but again, we're happy to answer any questions about anything specific that people are wondering about. Um, and then finally, I'm actually instantiating my DAG itself. Uh, so again, this is going to pass in my default arguments as well as give my DAG name, set a schedule interval, um, any other information that I want to set at the DAG level um, for how this DAG is going to behave, I can set here. Uh, and then I'm going to define all of my tasks. So again, each task is going to be wrapped by an operator. So uh, you tell Airflow uh, you want to create a new task by instantiating an operator and then providing it with any information that that operator might need. Uh, so you can see in the case of a dummy operator, there's obviously no information. It's not actually doing anything. Uh, in the case of a bash operator, uh, you can pass in a bash command. Uh, or a Python operator, you can pass in your Python callable. Uh, the final thing I'll note here on this example DAG is uh, this loop. So uh, we are generating these Python operators dynamically. Um, so again, you have kind of the power of Python behind you when you're working with Airflow. So um, you don't necessarily have to follow this exact you know, script where you define each operator. If you, um, you know, need to define your tasks dynamically, um, this is one way in which you can do so. Um, 
Oh, and then uh, the last few I'll show here as well. Um, this is a, a new perk with Airflow 2.1 uh, that's really useful is the calendar view. Um, so, and this is going to show me um, all of my DAG runs uh, and their status, but uh, actually laid out on a calendar. Um, it's not all that interesting on this particular DAG uh, because I've just run it manually, but you can imagine if um, you have more real world use cases where um, you're running things on a certain schedule, maybe those are on a business schedule um, and you know, you're um, running things, you know, on, you know, only weekdays or, or things like that, um, you can see that easily here. So from there, I'm going to go ahead and dive into the um, Snowflake specific ETL case and talk more about that. Um, for that, I'm going to be using this COVID data S3 to Snowflake DAG. And actually, before I talk about it in the UI, I'm going to hop over to my code editor and show it here. Um, so again, this is in that directory that I initialized my astronomer project. I have a DAGs folder that you can see has these um, five different tags in it. Um, those are corresponding to the ones that we were looking at in the UI. Um, so again, uh, the COVID to Snowflake DAG is the one that I'm going to go through here. Um, I'll note that uh, in order to use this, so again, the Snowflake um, is a provider package uh, within Airflow. So um, I have, in, have to install that package separately. So again, it's separate from the core Airflow distribution. Uh, in this particular case, I've added it to my requirements.txt file, so it will get installed for me. Um, you can do this in different ways depending on your Airflow infrastructure setup, um, but at, at the end of the day, they're just Python packages that you would pip install. Um, actually, before I go through that in too much depth, I'll also um, highlight kind of the astronomer registry that I talked about earlier. Um, if I look for the Snowflake provider, uh, you can see this is going to give me information both on uh, kind of the current version, uh, when it was last updated, um, how you can install it. Uh, so again, this is what I'm doing in my requirements.txt, but you could also pip install. Uh, and then it's going to show me kind of the available modules within uh, this operator, so uh, within this provider. So any operators, the Snowflake operator, um, any transfer operators, things like that. So. Uh, if you're just getting started, especially if you're particularly interested in Snowflake, uh, this is a great place to look um, to see kind of how these things work. Um, so from that, again, popping back to my code editor. So I've installed my provider package. Uh, that's going to give me access to uh, the operators and transfer operators within the Snowflake provider uh, that I can then use in this DAG. So you can see again at the top, uh, I'm importing both of them. Um, the goal of this DAG is to grab some data from a COVID API endpoint, uh, save it to S3, and then I'm going to transfer it from S3 into my Snowflake instance. I'm then going to do some transformations on that data uh, within Snowflake. So one thing I'll note here is that um, what I'm describing is actually more of an ELT framework. Uh, where I'm doing the transformations at the end and I'm offloading them to actually do them within Snowflake. Um, this is an ideal way of uh, doing kind of an ETL or ELT um, framework with using Airflow. Uh, while you do have, you know, the option of making transformations within Airflow itself using Python, um, Airflow is meant to be an orchestrator, not necessarily a processing framework. So that will work if your data are small. Um, but if you have larger data sets, uh, we would definitely recommend offloading that processing framework to something that was designed for it. Snowflake is a great option where you have a data warehouse that has built in compute so that you can use that there. Um, so that's what I'm doing in this example. Um, so after I import my operators, I define a Python function that's going to get my data. Um, so again, this is just grabbing COVID data from an API endpoint. Uh, it's then going to stick it to a flat file on S3. So to do that, I'm using the S3 hook. 
Uh, you can also see up here I'm importing the S3, or excuse me, the Amazon AWS provider package. So that's another provider package that we're making use of. Um, from there, again, I instantiate my DAG to find some uh, basic uh, parameters on how I want this DAG to behave. Uh, and then I get into the operators themselves. So I'm actually going to start down here uh, where I'm generating these tasks dynamically. Uh, so in this case, each one of my endpoints grabs a, um, grabs a file for a different US state. Um, so I'm defining those here. If I wanted to add another one, I could obviously do that easily um, by just adding it there. So again, this is just saving me some time if I want to make changes uh, so that I generate those tasks dynamically. Um, so my first uh, operator is that set of Python operators. So again, this is calling that upload to S3 function. Uh, it's parameterized for those different endpoints and the date that I want to pull. Um, I'm defining that date here uh, using a built-in Airflow variable. Uh, this is a great way of um, making use of Airflow variables or macros is a great way of uh, making your DAGs item potent. Um, so that if you have to rerun any past DAG runs, uh, you can still do so for the right date. Um, so you do that there. Uh, I'm then making use of the S3 to Snowflake transfer operator. Um, so again, this operator is ready to go out of the box. Super nice. You don't have to write any code beyond this to um, bring data in from S3 to Snowflake. Um, so benefit their community development. Um, I just define my uh, task ID and the S3 keys. So these are the files or the file in this case that it's going to look for. Um, I define my stage. So this is something that you set up on the Snowflake side. Um, Snowflake has great documentation for how to do this. Um, this is for any time you're uploading files from an external system. Um, so in this case, I set up an S3 stage. Uh, you would have to do this you know, within your Snowflake instance. Um, the rest of this is defining uh, where that data is going to go. Um, so the table and the schema, the role I want to use, um, and the file format. Uh, and then I have my Snowflake connection ID. So I'll go over the connection again um, in the UI in just a second, but this is going to be how Airflow interacts with um, or can connect to Snowflake. Um, finally, I mentioned that after that, I uh, performed some transformations on the data. So I have this pivot data task. Um, this is just using the Snowflake operator. Um, the way I implemented this in this case was to define a stored procedure within Snowflake that does the transformations. Um, and then, so I'm passing in a SQL uh, command that is going to call that stored procedure. Um, there are obviously lots of ways that you could do this. Uh, I could have defined a SQL script that gets called here that does the transformations for me and stored that SQL script uh, within my Airflow instance here. Um, probably lots of other ways, but again, the main point here is that I'm trying to offload that processing onto the Snowflake side. So Airflow is just going to orchestrate. It's going to tell Snowflake to run my stored procedure and do those transformations. Um, but none of that processing of the data is actually going to happen within Airflow. Um, the rest of this is similar. I define the role that I want to use and the schema, um, and then the Snowflake connection ID. So if I go back to the Airflow UI, uh, what this DAG looks like um, in a graphical view is, again, I have just kind of a dummy start task. I then have my Python operators here that generate, uh, pull my files from the API endpoint and save them into S3. I then have my S3 to Snowflake transfer operators that transfer that um, those files into my table in Snowflake. Uh, and then I have my transformation uh, using the Snowflake operator by calling the stored procedure. Uh, in this case, it's just doing some pivots on the data. Um, if I go to uh, the tree view, um, you can see I have some successful uh, runs of this DAG. Uh, you can also see before here where I had some failures. So I'll note that within Airflow, um, the UI can be a great way to uh, you know, view what's happening in your DAGs. 
for any tasks. Uh, if I click on the task instance, uh, it will give me a link to the logs where I can go and see um, you know, what's going on, especially if there's uh, any errors that you're trying to debug. This is a great place to start. And then finally, I mentioned uh, in the code earlier that uh, an important piece of this is how is Airflow going to actually connect to Snowflake? So uh, for that, I'm defining this Snowflake connection ID uh, in both of these tasks. Um, so what I've done here is defined an Airflow connection. Uh, so you can do those by uh, in the Airflow UI by going to admin and then connections. Uh, you can see I have the Snowflake one here. Um, this is going to, again, provide all of the information that Airflow needs in order to connect to my Snowflake instance. Um, uh, for Snowflake specifically, um, if you're running with, again, Airflow 2.0 or greater and using the most recent uh, version of the Snowflake provider package, the connection fields will actually update to show you what you need to input. So um, super nice. Usually Airflow connection fields are in historic versions of Airflow. Those are just standard. Um, so you would have to figure it out and put it into the extras. Um, this will actually update to kind of show you what you need to put in here. Um, so the main pieces are, again, your host. So you're going to have some sort of um, host domain for your Snowflake instance. Uh, you'll need your schema as well as credentials for that. Um, so login and password, and you'll need your Snowflake account, and then uh, other information, again, that you can put in, um, like the database you want to connect to, uh, the warehouse, um, the uh, role that you're going to use. Uh, you probably noticed in the code that, again, you can pass those into the operators as well. Um, so you know, multiple different ways that you can have your operator make use of those parameters. Um, but again, this having this setup is important so that Airflow can actually connect to your Snowflake instance. Um, so from there, uh, I can go ahead and run this um, just to show watching something in the UI. Uh, again, if anybody has not upgraded to Airflow 2.0 but is already using Airflow, um, I highly recommend doing so for uh, um, lots of reasons, but one of them being that uh, this auto update feature is really nice. You can watch things as they're going through. Um, I used to be one of those people that would sit and just click the refresh button over and over again, uh, waiting for a tag to finish. So you don't have to do that anymore. You can just sit and watch. Uh, but you can see that's now um, gone through uh, and loaded all of my data into Snowflake. I wanted to actually look at the Snowflake instance. Um, this is what the data looks like. So here's my state data table. Um, and you can see I have all of this data in there um, for different states. And then um, I have another table um, that contains the pivoted data. So um, again, using that ELT framework, uh, pretty easy to set up within Airflow, um, making use of that provider package. I'll kind of pause there. Uh, if there, it seems like there might be questions uh, that folks have thrown in the chat. Um, Kenton, Brad? that was amazing. I got a couple questions for you that uh, we'll, we'll feed you as they've been coming in. <laughs> so uh, first question is, what's the difference between Airflow's UI and astronomer, the variables in Airflow and the variables in astronomer? Um, is that, so when you say variables, is that like environment yeah. variables the, or? Both, <laughs> the environment sure. variables and the Airflow variables. Got it, got it. So um, I'll start with that and then I'll come back to the UI, but uh, so Airflow variables are and built-in variables within Airflow for um, you to, you know, template your DAGs and um, pull information in at runtime. So uh, this is one example of using a built-in one. You can also define your own. It's just that Airflow has these built-in so that you don't have to worry about them, mostly like dates and things like that. Um, that's 
separate from an environment variable in your Airflow instance that you can also set. Um, they're kind of used for different things. Um, environment variables are typically used to control your Airflow configuration, or they can be used to set things like connections. So you saw me go over the Snowflake connection. Um, rather than filling that out here in the UI, um, you could also set something like this using environment variables. Um, you can access them uh, within your DAGs as well. Um, so just kind of a couple of different, different ways of getting at sort of different things. Um, in terms of the UI, uh, Airflow versus Astronomer, well, I guess I'll also say that all of that is the same on the Astronomer platform. So you can still use uh, Airflow environment variables or templated variables, just like I've done here. Um, the UI is also going to be the same from an Airflow perspective. It's just Astronomer provides a control plane where you can manage all of your Airflow instances. So you'll have a separate Astronomer UI as well um, to look at things um, across Airflow deployments and manage your infrastructure, things like that. I'm not sure if that answered that question. That was a lot of different things, but <laughs> yeah. hopefully got some of it. I think you got it. I think you got it. Awesome. Cool. Um, another question is, can we pass a SQL three query through a file? Yes, absolutely. I actually have an example of that um, just to show you. And I, I will also say that uh, in general, as a best practice, I would actually even recommend passing it through a file as opposed to what I did here. Um, obviously, if you just have one line of SQL, probably doesn't matter that much, but your DAG is going to be a lot cleaner if you pass it in through a separate file. Um, as an example of that, I have this other DAG called Param Query. Um, you can see this one's also using a Snowflake operator. Um, in this case, I'm passing in this Param Query.sql file. Uh, the only difference in the DAG that allows me to do this is I have to define a template search path that tells Airflow where that file is going to be, like where to look for it. Um, if you put everything in your DAGs folder, you wouldn't need this, but uh, I did not as a sort of organizational uh, preference. So I have this param query.sql file in my include directory. You can see it here. And then this is just SQL. Um, you can notice in this case, it's also parameterized uh, in a similar way as my other DAG was. So you can still do things like that. Um, the include directory is something that we ship with uh, with the Astronomer CLI and Astronomer Airflow projects. Uh, again, just as a way to organize things, it's meant for external files that your DAGs might be pulling in. Um, but you can, you know, sort of organize your project in whatever way works best for you. Um, but that's the short answer. There is yes, you definitely can. Awesome. So Wayne is asking. What are some other tools recommended for the transformation for the transformation piece between S3, Airflow, and Snowflake? Is doing a transform to Snowflake like this demo best practice, or are there other things that you can do? Yeah, um, I would say you know Snowflake is particularly good for that because again, it's designed for that, and that you have compute built into your data warehouse, so it works really well for an um, ELT type uh, framework. Uh, certainly not the only tool, so um, you could use, you know, any other processing framework. Um, I've seen, you know, people use Spark and Databricks and, and things like that. Um, PP is another one that works well in that sort of end step um, use case for, um, you know, doing transformations or um, models with your data. Um, those are the ones that come to mind for me, Viraj, I don't know if you have any others that you've seen. No, I think you hit the nail on the head there, right? The nice part is you can choose whatever tool best fits your needs. Um, another pattern we've seen a lot of times is actually once that data is in Snowflake, you're pushing it back out into some other tool using a tool like Census or any of the other reverse ETL tools out there. So you can really pick and choose everything you need for your, uh, for your platform. A few more questions here. So I'm going to keep, keep, keep throwing them right at you. Um, do most of the other operators also support templating? Michael Glaros is asking. Um, yes, I believe that you can do that with most any of them. Yeah, for sure. Um, question we got also before, before the webinar as well, 
Um, do you see use cases where Airflow and DBT are combined together? Um, are there overlaps or are they like separate tools? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have seen them uh, uh, used together. Um, I would say, you know, again, we've talked a lot through this talk about how Airflow is meant to be an orchestrator. It's designed to play with different tools, um, sometimes through provider packages or sometimes um, otherwise. Uh, it can be a really, really good um, tool paired with DBT so that you have sort of a, you know, first class orchestrator um, and scheduler and also get, again, the benefits of, you know, doing data modeling and transformations in DBT. So, um, we definitely have seen them used together uh, successfully. I think we have a couple of blog posts about doing so and kind of methods by which you might go about that. Um, that's something that the community has been pretty active in is um, making the story for those tools, you know, using those tools together stronger. Um, so we expect that we'll get, you know, even better from a user perspective kind of as things go forward. Yeah, I would say that a lot of our customers are doing that Exactly right, where DBT is handling things within the warehouse, and Airflow will help feed the data to the warehouse itself. Um, Kenton, can you run a jar file using Airflow? Uh, yes. I would say probably the bash operator would be the best way to do that that comes to mind for me. Um, and you would run it as a, as a bash command. Um, Maybe there are better ways. That's the that's the top of mind one. Um, but yes, you definitely could. Yeah, our customers usually do that, or they'll uh, use like the Kubernetes pod operator and just run a separate pod for that jar file. Sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Let's see here. There's a couple of questions to choose from here. Um, cool. So, you know, I think question around how sensors could work here, um, but would the would the snowflake snowflake provider trigger the job as soon as there's files to load, or do you have to do something in between the files arriving and the airflow triggering the job? Molly's asking that question. Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, just like you said, Raj, I think a, a really good opportunity for sensors. Um, that's exactly what they're designed for. Uh, depending on where, so in this particular use case, there is an S three file sensor that will specifically watch an S3 bucket for files to arrive and then trigger, uh, move on to the rest of the tasks in your DAG. So for this very specific use case, um, that would work really well. Uh, if you had files landing you know, somewhere else that maybe there's not a specific sensor for, there are still more generic sensors that you could make use of there. Um, so yes, you absolutely can make it, again, if you, you know, if you have something like this and you're going to have files arriving, you don't know when, I would definitely recommend using sensors so that you don't have to, you know, run your DAG on a schedule and have it not do stuff a lot of the time. That's what those are built for. Yeah. Um, so, you know, on that note, when you're looking to accomplish a use case like that, right, you're waiting for data to land in S3 and then maybe you want to push it to Snowflake. Um, are you usually writing all the code from scratch? Um, is it auto-generated or is there somewhere that you can pull examples from? Um, the registry is a great place to pull examples. So uh, I'm just going to go back and actually go to one of these uh, options. And you can see, so I'm looking at the S3 to Snowflake uh, operator here that I was using. Um, you can see there's an example DAGs uh, section here. Um, that is going to give me, again, example code where it's all done for me. So this would probably be my recommendation for best place to start. Um, there are example DAGs for a lot of the provider packages out there, a lot of the operators. And again, it's just um, both kind of boilerplate code and some also kind of more sophisticated examples um, for different use cases. So that's, um, in that case, you're likely not going to have to start from scratch for the DAG that I showed here. Uh, I didn't write any of that code from scratch. It was all pulled from examples like this and, and kind of other DAGs that we used. So um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there uh, in the community to make that easier for you. Um, I love all the example DAGs in the registry. It makes any new workflow so much easier. Um, 
Do you have any best practices on dealing with staging intermediary tables if you're doing the processing within the warehouse itself? That's a good question. That's going back to my uh, just <laughs> data engineering days as opposed to specifically airflow. Um, I think staging tables can be really useful um, both just for recovery purposes and for you know helping design like item potent DAGs. Um, you know, using like incremental loads uh, is definitely a best practice that we recommend um, if possible. So not having your DAG just do all of your data, having each DAG run do a chunk of data um, and using staging tables along with that method can be a really useful way of doing that because you oftentimes need to be able to put the data somewhere in the middle before you load it into the table that has everything. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if that's helpful. Just uh, I I would recommend using them. I think I think they're really useful in a lot of use cases. And I um, in my past life, uh, Chris Farmer used them a lot myself um, when you know doing data engineering for clients. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what about uh, CI/CD? So do you have any recommendations around CICD with Airflow? Um. Yes, um, my, my really quick recommendation is do it. Um, <laughs> one of the uh, you know, benefits to having code-based data pipelines is that you can integrate them in with just any other software development lifecycle. Um, using CICD is a big part of that. Um, at Astronomer, we recommend that all of our customers do so, and it's very straightforward to deploy to the Astronomer platform using CI/CD. You know, obviously, how you use CI/CD with Airflow is going to come down to sort of where your Airflow is deployed and like where your DAGs are coming from and um, how you know all of your Airflow infrastructure is set up. So, um, I can certainly reference you know documentation on how to do that with the Astronomer platform and most of the common CI/CD tools out there. Um, that's available on our website. Um, but again, I, no matter kind of where you're running Airflow, I would absolutely recommend um, using CI/CD to deploy your DAGs, especially to like production instances. Yeah, there's so many ways you can do CI. Um, it really depends on so much of that infrastructure setup that you have. Um, question from the LinkedIn stream. Um, can you use Airflow operators for event triggered operations like the same way you can for cron scheduled ones? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So is that similar to just like you want your operator to run based on an event as opposed to a schedule? Yeah, exactly. Right. So how is Airflow's event driven story? Got it. Um, so that I think also comes back to um, sensors uh, are probably the you know easiest way of implementing something like that. Um, oftentimes the way sensors will work is, you know, they're going to wait for something to happen before moving on to the rest of the tasks in your DAG. So um, they're you know, can be implemented in that way. So if you have an operator that you only want to run, you know, after something else has happened, you might have a sensor task before it um, to sort of stop it from happening if that event hasn't occurred. Um, you could also get creative with, you know, branching and things like that um, within your DAG. So you don't have to just run, you know, your tasks all the way through. You can make them more conditional in general through um, things like branching or short circuiting. Uh, so that could be another way if you had, you know, other tasks within your DAG that were um, doing things or checking for external um, things after they've run. Uh, kind of just depends on your use case and like what those tasks are actually doing. Um, but you can absolutely do something like that. Awesome. Kenton, I think we could sit here and take questions all day, but I think we're just about at time today. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for coming and for the wonderful questions and discussion. Uh, I know we didn't get to all of these, but if it's really pressing to you, please feel free please feel free to reach out to us and we'll definitely get it answered. Um, like we were saying, all the code and the presentation will be sent out to you all as a follow-up. 
Um, and you know, lastly, uh, please register for the Airflow Summit. You know, if you're a fan of this content, there's going to be this and so much more at uh, at the Airflow Summit starting on July eighth. Um, that's all from my side. Kenton, anything from you before we before we call things a wrap? I don't think so. Uh, like for our said, again, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we love having these conversations and having um, such a you know vibrant community out there with lots of engagement. So that's really great to see. And yeah, I was also just going to reiterate, um, register for the Airflow Summit. Uh, I'm really excited. Shameless self plug. I will be speaking, um, and I'm excited about that too. So um, there are tons of other good talks. Uh, I really wish I could join all of them. Um, and they're in lots of different time zones as well, so that no matter where you are, there will be something that you can tune into. All right. Thanks, everyone. We will see you next time.